The Western liberal man has no honour because the Western liberal man has lost his Judeo-Christian understanding. And that is why, amongst the English, amongst the Western Europeans, men break their word casually. I want to talk about vows, ladies and gentlemen. The importance of vows in our life. I don't want to try and raise the topic of conversation above a shouting match. Vows are something that we say regularly as Christians. We say regularly vows as Christians. We make vows all the time. Promises. Most of them we do off the cuff and most of them we do without thinking about their importance. But as a Christian, when we think about vows, we have to think about the importance of vows from the scripture and what the scriptures say about vows. It says in Numbers 30 verse 2, if a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath, to bind himself by a pledge. He shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. In Deuteronomy 23, 21, it reads, if you make a vow to the Lord, your God, you shall not delay in fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. In Ecclesiastes 5.5 it states, it is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Central to the Christian way of life is the importance of keeping your vows, of keeping your promises. And we know that the religious of the Christian community, the monks and the priests, take vows to continue in a certain kind of life. But there are secular vows, vows that we make as laity as, as the everyday Christian. I think, for example, of baptismal vows. So the baptismal vows are things that are said on your behalf when you were a child, or they are said as part of your initiation into the Christian faith. And then they are repeated at your confirmation. And the baptismal vows are these. Do you reject the devil and rebellion against God? Do you renounce the deceit and the corruption of evil? Do you repent of the sins that separate us from God and neighbor? Do you turn to Christ as Saviour? Do you submit to Christ as Lord? Do you come to Christ the way, the truth and the life? After which are each of these statements, the Christian vows, I do. And so, as Christians, there is this concept of secular vows. As Christians, we believe that there is such a thing a secular vocation, that God has called you to a certain kind of life. God may have called you to be a plumber, a carpenter. He may have called you to be a husband. He may have called you to be a wife, a father. He may have called you to be a brother or a, a GP. And in all of these spheres, or a celibate, in all of these years, it is right and it is proper for a Christian to make vows, to make pledges by which they will govern their conduct, by which they will commit themselves to a certain kind of life. So examples of secular vows in trade would be that you vow only ever to charge an honest price 
for your labor, that you vow never to deal corruptly or never to deal in corrupt methods, that you vow never to cheat your customers. These are the kinds of vows that Christian tradesmen can make, just like a husband vows to his wife to be faithful, and just like a wife vows to her husband to be obedient and loyal. Vows govern our behavior, and I encourage you to govern your life with vows in your secular vocation, in the thing that God has called you to. Mothers can vow to raise their children as Christians, can vow to sacrifice themselves for the good of their children. Use vows to guide you in your vocation. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 34, our Lord said this, that you shall not swear by anything in heaven, for that is God's kingdom, nor by the earth, for that is God's footstool. And lots of Christians think that this means that Christ has commanded us not to make vows. This is false. Christ commands us not to swear an oath on a thing, not to place your honor on some other created thing because that created thing belongs to God and is under God's authority, not your own. You can't even swear by your own head because you can't turn one hair on your own head gray because the hairs on your head are not under your authority, they are under God's authority. But swearing and vows are different things. Vows are simply statements of firm intention and conviction. Christ admonishes us in Matthew 12, at verse 33 to 37. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 to 37, our Lord says these words, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit, and you brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Thank you so much, bro. Christ cautions us to be careful with our words. That means we should be careful with the promises we make. How many hearts have been broken by careless words? How many lives ruined by careless statements? How many psychologies of mind have been loaded with injury because of careless speech? Christ says, that for every careless word, you will give an account. So be careful of the words that you speak. And this means also being careful in the vows that you make. Vows and promises govern our lives, and we should use them to govern our lives. Just like we do at marriage, we vow to be faithful. You can make vows for any vocation in life, even your job. GPs make vows 
It's called the Hippocratic Oath. They swear not to do harm. So for instance, if you are a trader on the stock market, you can vow not to trade in dirty money. If you are a plumber, you can vow not to overprice your customers. Use vows to govern your behavior. Furthermore, we should be careful of the vows that we make. And on this point, I'm going to land and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and when he passed through Mizpah of Gilead and through Mizpah of Gilead he went on to the sons of Ammon. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said if you will indeed give me the sons of Ammon to my hand then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Mammon. It shall be the Lord's and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them and the Lord gave them into his hands. It continues after he had defeated the people of Ammon that when Jephthah came to his house at Mezpah, behold, his daughter was coming out to meet with him with tambourines and with dancing. Now she was one, she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low and you are among those who trouble me. For I have given my word to the Lord and I cannot take it back. So that she said to him, my father, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you have said, since the Lord has avenged your enemies, the sons of Ammon. So Jephthah had swore that he would sacrifice the first thing that came out of his house. And the first thing that came out of his house was his daughter. This is a story to caution us about the vows that we make. Do not make reckless vows. Do not make vows that you would later regret. Only make vows that build up your character that build up virtue in your life, that push you towards the good. Don't make blase promises. Don't make promises that you will regret if you have to keep them. The daughter is mourned in Jewish tradition. The daughter is celebrated as the hero in Christian tradition. This passage cautions us about the vows that we make, especially to the Lord, but it does not invalidate making vows. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions going once? <laughs> Sorry? Yes. And the thing, the thing is, in our culture in the West, it used to be a thing that if a man gave his word, if he made a promise that he would have to keep it, men used to have a sense of honor in the West. But now, in today's progressive culture, people throw their words around willy-nilly. They throw their words around casually. They make threats they don't keep. They don't keep their bargains when they make them. The Western liberal man has no honor because the Western liberal man 
has lost his Judeo-Christian understanding. And that is why, amongst the English, amongst the Western Europeans, men break their word casually. They betray their friends. They betray their girlfriends. They betray their wives. They abandon their children. They abandon their families because the honour of the Western man has been squandered because the honour of the Western man has been lost because he has separated himself from those Judeo-Christian values of honouring your word. The point of a vow is that it guides you to the good, it makes you resolute, it makes you stable in your inner man. Any questions on the topic? Any questions going once? Is it ever right to betray? Is it ever, ever right to go back on one's word? Ever? So the question is, is it right to go back on a promise? Ever. Is it right to go back on a vow? The answer to this is yes. If you have made a vow like Jafar, and that vow would lead you to kill your own daughter. Of course you repent of this vow. Of course you abandon it. Vows that call you to break God's law are not vows that you should keep. Vows that call you to evil are vows that you should free yourself from through repentance. Any other question on the topic of vows? Any questions? The topic is vows. Any question? Would you make a vow not to come back? The question is Would I make a vow never to come back? If the price was, say, to save. Christian lives, yes I would. Any other questions on the topic? Is really vows was a Judeo-Christian culture since, let's say, um, at the time of Israelites when they lived in Egypt, in the process when Moses was lead them, they used to do bad things to their own people. And, yes. You know, and Moses was was angry with them and talked to God yeah. about what the situation was. What's the question, brother, please? So my question is, is it really vow? Is really a culture in Judeo Christian society yeah. at the time of uh, at yeah. that time? Okay. So the difference between the vows and the culture of vows that we see in the Old Testament and the vows that we see practiced amongst Christians today is that Christians believe that the law of God is more important than your vow. So if you vow in error to break God's law, then God's law must stand and your vow must fall. But this does not invalidate the use of vows. The Western world has lost the importance of keeping your promise. Our legal system is built upon the idea of honouring your pledge. That's why one party can take another party to court if they break a legal contract. But the point of Christian culture is that it goes deeper than this. It should not need the courts to enforce. Your honour should be sufficient to enforce. Because your word that you give to your children, your word that you give to your business partner, your word that you give to your friend, your word that you give to your wife, 
Your word that you give to your bishop should mean something to you. You should feel honor bound to stand by what you say with conviction from the inner man, to honor your pledge. That is why we make vows, so that we act like honorable men. And Western culture has lost something because it has abandoned this idea of honor and keeping your word. Any other questions on the topic of vows? Okay, so if you promise to do something and you let the other person down, how is that angering God? So the question is, if you promise to do something and you let the other person down, how is that angering God? Depends entirely on the circumstances. It's not a general rule. If you try to fulfill your word and you can't, you haven't broken your word. You simply fail to accomplish it. Sometimes you make promises and you simply can't manage to fulfill them. But if you make a promise and you abandon that promise, you have failed yourself to be a man. You are less than a man because you have failed to keep your promise if you have decided to abandon your promise. What does the Bible say about annihilation? We're talking about vows, bro. Any other questions on the topic of vows? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening.